Wow. Do y'all believe it's Easter? Time to celebrate. Well, happy Easter, everyone. I'm going to just uh, briefly say a few words. Yeah, I will be brief, y'all. You won't believe me, but I will. If you uh, don't have a Bible with you, uh, there's pew Bibles there in the pews. You can turn to page uh, 1085. You'll be right on where we're going to be in John chapter 20. If I were to ask you long-time Bible students that are here this morning to name some unbelievers in Scripture, I bet you could do it. I bet you could think of people, you're probably thinking of someone right now that Scripture tells us was an unbeliever and um, skeptic and so forth. But I bet none of you would name Jesus' closest disciples. And I want you to know this morning that all of them actually fit the definition of unbeliever when it comes to how they felt about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now they were obviously believers in Jesus. But they had failed to catch hold of the concept of the resurrection of Christ. In other words, they believed, but... Not completely. It's reminiscent of the man who had the demon-possessed son who came to Jesus. If you have a bulletin, if you'll look on the, the very back page right there in the middle, that's where we'll be looking at a few verses today. It's under the title of our message, Had They Really Believed? This is about some disciples that life would have been a little bit different for them in a, in a good way had they really believed. But it's reminiscent of the demon, the, the man who had a demon-possessed son. He came to Jesus. We read about him in Mark chapter 9, verses 23 and 24. Jesus said to him, All things are possible to him who believes. And immediately the boy's father cried out and said, I do believe. Help my unbelief. In the church this morning, not only across our nation, but across the world, Christians are celebrating the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But not those first disciples of Christ on that original resurrection day. They weren't celebrating. But they could have had they really believed. Here's what we read in John chapter 20, in verse 1. It says, Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came early to the tomb while it was still dark and saw the stone already taken away from the tomb. And she ran and she came to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved and said to them, Jesus has been resurrected. He's alive. Is that what your Bible says? It's not what my Bible says either. My Bible says, they, don't they get blamed for a lot of things? You know, they say if you do this, and they say, but you never know who they are. We don't know who they are here either, and she didn't either, but here's what she says. They, they have taken away the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. She goes on to, to say, well, the Bible goes on to talk about how Peter and John then raced off to the tomb to check out Mary's story. And then we drop down to verse 9 and 10 and, and we read something that's a little sad too. It says, For as yet they did not understand the Scripture that He must rise again from the dead. So the disciples went away again to their own homes. Sadly, even though Jesus had told these men and women many, many, many times that this day was going to come, even though He had told them the resurrection of Jesus Christ seemed to be the farthest thing from their mind. How about you this morning? 
I dare say many of you, most of you, have probably heard the Easter story many, many, many times. But has it really resonated with you exactly what happened on those very spectacular three days and three nights? So what was their problem? Simply this, unbelief. Unbelief. This might explain Mary's action in the following verse, verse 11. But Mary was standing outside the tomb weeping. And so as she wept, she stooped and looked into the tomb where she saw two angels, one at the head and one at the feet of where Jesus had been lying. And they said to her, woman, why are you weeping? And her answer is, because they, they have taken away my Lord and I do not know where they have laid him. The Bible goes on to say that when she had said this, she turned, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there and did not know that it was Jesus. And Jesus said to her, same question, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if, if you carried him away, tell me where you have laid him and, and I will take him away. How I many of you know, no one takes the Lord anywhere. Jesus told, told us in John 10, 17 to 18, he says, I lay my life down so I take it back up again. No one takes my life. I lay my life down by my own initiative. But Mary thought that she could find him and she could take him somewhere. This woman by herself could carry the body of a full grown man somewhere else. But you know what? That's what unbelief does. It enables irrational thinking, irrational decisions. You say, well, maybe that was just Mary. Maybe Mary just had that kind of problem on that first resurrection morning. No, the truth is, the rest of the disciples, they didn't score any better in the belief department either. Mark tells us about several women that went to the tomb that morning. They saw the angels. They heard from the angels. Their initial reaction, we read in Mark 16, 8, they went out and fled from the tomb for trembling and astonishment had gripped them. And they said nothing to anyone for they were afraid. Now, obviously, a little time went by. They gathered themselves a bit and returned to testify of what they had seen and heard. We get their response from, from Luke. Luke 24, 8 to 11. And they remembered his words, returned from the tomb, reported all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. Now they were telling these things to the apostles, but these words appeared to them as nonsense. And they would not believe them. We have an additional response to Mary's testimony in Mark 16, 10 to 11. She went and reported to those who had been with him while they were mourning and weeping. And when they heard that he was alive and had been seen by her, they refused to believe it. They should have been celebrating on this day. This is the most glorious day in all of history to this point. But yet, because of unbelief. Unbelief in something that the one they truly believed in had told them over and over again. They were not celebrating. They were weeping and mourning and, and sad and, and, and rejecting the message. Later on that day, on the road to Emmaus, the resurrected Lord catches up with two of the disciples as they walk along discussing the events 
of the last three days. We read this in Luke 24, 17. Jesus sneaks up with them and catches up with them. And he says to them, what are these words that you are exchanging with one another as you are walking? And they stood still looking sad. You see a pattern here? They attempted to explain to Jesus, oddly, all of the evidence that they had already seen and heard of a resurrection. And yet, this blows my mind. They still left Jerusalem in unbelief. I love Jesus' response to what they've just told him about all this evidence. They saw pieces and heard pieces, and, but they left anyway. Here's Jesus' response in Luke 24, 25. And he said to them, Oh, foolish men, and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. It's almost like Jesus would say in our vernacular, What's wrong with you guys? It was right there in front of your faces. And you still wouldn't believe it. It's not that you couldn't believe it. You chose not to believe it. And you walked away. What is wrong with you? When they finally did believe, he sat with them. He broke bread. They saw the holes in his hands and they believed. They understood who he was. They got up. They rushed back to Jerusalem to tell the other disciples about what they had seen and heard and who they had seen and heard from. And again, the reaction in that moment in Luke 24, 36 to 38, while they were telling these things, he himself stood in their midst and said to them, Peace be with you. And they were startled and frightened and thought that they were seeing a spirit, a ghost. Again, because this idea of a resurrection was still so foreign to them. And he said to them, why are you troubled? And why do doubts arise in your heart? You see what unbelief does? It troubles us. It brings nothing but doubt into our hearts. Mark adds this in Mark 16, 13. And they went away and reported to the others, but they did not believe them either. Obviously, that happened just before Jesus appeared. Again, what was their problem? Unbelief. I won't even get into Thomas. Remember doubting Thomas and his unbelief? We'll save that for another day. Here's the point I wanted to make, though. Though Jesus had promised it time and time and time again, the resurrection of Jesus Christ was simply absent from their belief package. You have a belief package, don't you? Sure you do. Or you likely wouldn't even be here at all this morning. You see, this is not a question in whether they or you or I, whether we believe in God, whether we believe in Jesus, as these beliefs are front and center in our belief package. Most of you, if not all of you, those of you who are saved would agree that you entered into a relationship with Jesus through Believing in Christ in this way. Look with me on the front of the bulletin this morning from Romans 10, 9 to 10. If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart a person believes, resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. That's how we come to faith in Christ. But the issue here in this story was not salvation belief, as I'm sure these disciples of Jesus had that kind of faith. The issue here is resurrection belief. The kind of faith that enables resurrection power in the life of a believer. How about you and I? Are we truly living the life of resurrection power? In other words, 
Does our lifestyle give evidence of a real relationship with the resurrected Lord Jesus Christ? You see, when all of these disciples failed to believe in the resurrection, their lives gave visible evidence of lives that were governed by fear and confusion. Look back again with me at the words that I've underlined here in your bulletin in these verses. Their lives were governed by things like trembling and astonishment and being afraid, nonsense even, mourning and weeping and sadness and foolishness and slowness of heart to believe and being frightened and startled and troubled and full of doubt. These men believed in Jesus, but this, this absence of resurrection power in their life due to unbelief had left them looking like this. This was the evidence that they were showing in their lives. These results, these are the results of unbelief that limits resurrection power in the life of the believer. So why is resurrection power so important for the child of God? Is it not just enough for me to believe in Jesus, that He saved me from my sins? What's this about resurrection power? Why is it important? I'll tell you why. Because without it, we will live a limited spiritual life. How many of you know God doesn't want you to live a limited spiritual life? He wants you to, to have everything that he has to offer. He wants it all to be manifested in our lives. Because it is God himself that has enabled us to taste all the glories of our salvation. If we don't have resurrection power in our lives, it will negatively affect our prayer life, our witness, our boldness, even our relationships, as our lives, even though we're saved, even though we're secured by the King of Kings, our lives will, will tend to be constrained by emotions like we found in all of these underlined words. But I want you to know something else. It'll also affect our faith going forward. Our faith in the future. Our faith in what God has for us in the future. You see, that was their problem. They didn't understand what Jesus was trying to say to them for three and a half years. I've got something really special for you in the future. Not too far away. But they missed it. And because they missed it, they missed all the glories that went with it. See, when we live without resurrection power in our life, we're going to be affected neg negatively in our faith about the future. You see, if we struggle to live like we believe in the most important event in past history, that is the resurrection of Jesus Christ, how will we even begin to believe and be comforted, even empowered by the Lord's promises for our future. Do you know what you believe as a believer? Do you know why you believe as a believer? Do you understand what you have been promised? I want to take you maybe to an unusual place on Resurrection Sunday. If you'll turn with me your Bible, and I didn't, I didn't check to see what page this was on, I'm sorry. For those of you who are using a pew Bible, turn with me to 1 Thessalonians. Chapter 4. Because just as Jesus promised those disciples something in their future, Jesus is promising us something in our future. Here's what we read in 1 Thessalonians 4, beginning in verse 13. Because the Apostle Paul understood here that there was some confusion going on over what Jesus had promised, just like it was in the disciples' day. 
He says this, but we do not want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep. In other words, those who have passed on before you. So that you will not grieve as do the rest who have no hope. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again. You see how the future belief is tied to the past belief. Even so, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain, if we're here when He comes, if we're still living and alive, we'll get to see that moment, and then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. I want you to see something about that passage. That passage has a purpose. It's a promise with a purpose. How many of you know, church, we, believers in Christ, we are the people of promise. What is that promise? What's the purpose of this promise? It's to bring us comfort in the here and now. I mean, you know, we live in a pretty tumultuous world right now. A little comfort would be very welcome, wouldn't it? And Jesus says, I promise you that. You can have comfort, and I want you to take that comfort and then in turn, turn it around and let it empower you for a radical, faith-filled life. As you live for God. Not in the least bit inhibited by all of these underlying words. This was not God's plan. Sadness and doubt and mourning and, and all of these other things. He doesn't want us to be inhibited by those things. He wants us to have a faith that rests in resurrection power that was provided for us in the past and rapture power that is promised to us in the future, enabling us to live the life that God has intended for us to live in the present. You see, because Jesus rose from the dead, just as He promised. Jesus will also come and raise us up in the future just as He promised. You know, many people around Easter, they visit cemeteries. They take flowers and they put them on the graves for the, their, their loved ones and so forth. And that's a beautiful thing. But I want you to know something. I want you to think about the next time you do that. I want you to think about the next time you go into a cemetery. For whatever reason. I want you to think about, about never again visiting a cemetery thinking about it as a burial ground. I want you to begin to think of a cemetery as a resurrection ground. Because that's what's going to happen there. Because Jesus promised. Graves are going to burst open. And people are going to be caught up in, to the Lord and changed in a moment. And if we're alive and remain when it happens, we'll go up with them. But that's resurrection ground for the saints. You see, what was sown there in weakness, the Bible says will be raised one day in glory. And what a glorious day that will be. But not only for those who have really believed, 
It will only be for those who have really believed. In Christ, the way we see here on the front of our bulletin, if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. Believe in your heart. God raised Him from the dead. And you will be saved. For with the heart, a person believes, resulting in righteousness. And with his mouth, he confesses, resulting in salvation. I heard a story just this morning. I'll end with this. About Albert Einstein. One day he was taking a, a, a train ride. And he was on, his, on the train and the conductor was coming by and he was punching tickets. And he got to Albert Einstein and Albert couldn't find his ticket. And he was checking his pockets and he, he just couldn't find the ticket. And the conductor said, oh, that's okay, Mr. Einstein. I know who you are. I know you purchased a ticket. Don't worry about it. And the conductor went on down the aisle punching other tickets. He looked back and he saw Albert Einstein on his knees looking under his seat. Desperately looking for that ticket. And he turned around and he went back to him and he said, Mr. Einstein, I told you, you don't need to worry. I know who you are. And Albert Einstein said, I know who I am. I just want to know where I'm going. Do you know where you're going? Do you know where you're going this morning? Better yet, do you know how to get there? We read about it right here on the front of our bulletin. If we confess with our, our mouth, Jesus is Lord. Believe in our heart that God raised Him from the dead. He's conquered death, sin, hell, and the grave. All of it on our behalf. We put our faith and trust in Him. That's how we get there. If anyone's here this morning and they're not sure if they're going there or how to get there, I hope you'll stay and talk this morning. Until then, we talked about a glorious day when the Lord comes back. The fact that He came out of that grave promises that He's coming back for us as well. That wasn't the end of something. It was really the beginning of a glorious day for all of us.